Welcome. At this moment, many people are asking, what has happened to America? Over the past decade, the land has become increasingly strange and frightening. Hate and violence are everywhere. Millions are confused and terrified. Many others who should be afraid are not. Instead, they are filled with a strange, unreasoning passion. The darkness is increasing everywhere. How have we gotten to this horrible place? Most of all, how has the Christian church turned into a self-destructing shambles? In this talk given over 10 years ago in a Hollywood studio lot, I suggest some specific reasons. We have talked in the past about a subject called transhumanism. Perhaps you saw the headline a few weeks ago, Scientists combine human cell and jellyfish into human laser. Did you see this one? Does that sound real to you? It's dead real. It's true. You've all wanted to be uh, X-Men. Recently, this is true, this is the story, light-emitting proteins from jellyfish were combined with a single human embryonic uh, kidney cell, creating a living biological laser. After it was created, they fed this new cell pulses of blue light. It then emitted a directional laser beam visible to the naked eye from one cell. They hoped to use it to examine cell structures or even to treat a disease that attacks cells. That sounds wonderful, doesn't it? You know, uh, yeah, it's the beginning of a horror movie. That's right. Just, just remember that for every scientific discovery that we have in this in this world. There's both an upside and a downside to it. And all of the aberrations that you're going to be seeing appear in the next decade or more, and you are going to see some, will be given to us with fabulous reasons why they help humanity. Only afterward, afterward will we discover the darkness that is built into these creations. Just exactly what is the dark potential for a billion or so lasers in your body? Uh, that can be turned on from the outside. That doesn't sound pleasant to me, even if it's supposed to help me. During this past month, another story appeared in the British newspaper, the Daily Mail. Perhaps you saw this one. Forever Young is the title. The pill that will keep you youthful by preventing the ills of old age. Here's the story. Forever Young is a, a drug that allows people to grow old gracefully, and it could be available in just the next 10 years, so says a leading scientist, Professor Linda Partridge, an expert in genetics of aging said that the science is moving so quickly that it will soon be possible to prevent many of the ills of old age. By taking a pill a day from middle age, that from that point on we will be able to grow old free from the illnesses of the body, such as things like Alzheimer's and uh, so heart disease. All of these things will just be left behind. People could work for longer. You wouldn't have to retire until you were about 85. Isn't that a good deal? Uh, you know, or they could work longer, they could, or they could simply just enjoy their retirement for a long time. After a certain period of time, I suppose you'd just drop off. But uh, some research even suggests that skin and hair will retain its youthful luster. Professor Partridge of the University College London said, if told you could take a drug that has minimal side effects, <clears throat> that's going to keep you healthy for another five or ten years, and then you will just drop off your perch without any disabilities, most people would want it, wouldn't they? Extraordinary as the professor's prediction may seem, so this story says it's based on a host of promising scientific studies from around the world. They have discovered the key genes that linked to longevity and health and found ways of tinkering with them, at least in animals. In one of the ex remarkable examples of the study that's been done already, a Harvard University doctor made old mice young again. At the start of the experiment, the animal's skin, brains, guts, and other organs resembled those of an 80-year-old person. Within just two months of being given a drug that switches on a key enzyme, the creatures had grown so many new cells that they had almost completely rejuvenated. Remarkably, the male mice went out and went from being infertile to fathering large litters. <laughs> now that is a truly frightening thought. Of course, this kind of discovery is only a few steps from prolonging life perhaps for hundreds of years. It's not far away, and it sounds so obtuse to view these discoveries negatively. But what will be the unintended consequences? Faith in science has already replaced faith in God. 
How much more will that be the case in the future? We could go on and on with all sorts of discoveries. Research that you hear little about, such as, maybe you did see this one, replacement of organs for humans by injecting a patient's stem cells into a pig. The pig would then grow the new human organ in its body. Now, I've known a few human pigs. It doesn't seem like much of a jump to go to, a jump to, go to pig <laughs> humans. But or, there was another one this week. U.S. scientists said that they have developed an on-off memory switch that helped laboratory rats remember a behavior that they had forgotten. The brain prosthesis marks the first time that researchers have been able to duplicate the brain's learning process, restoring memories that test rats were drugged to forget. The discovery could offer hope for people with dementia. Well, that's good. My wife would like to have one of those switches installed in my head right now, I think. But let's see, let's see, what's the downside of a device that could turn off your memory? Well, we as a culture are watching the antics of the Kardashians or absorbed in American Idol or sports or any of the other entertainment drugs that are proffered to us. The world is moving rapidly toward a fundamental transformation that will come like a tsunami. For many of us who are students of the Bible, all of this is moving in a particular direction. We are heading back to all the strange evil that existed before the great flood of Noah. Satan wants to fulfill on the promises that he made to Eve in the Garden of Eden. You will be as a god, knowing good and evil, and you will not surely die. Power and eternal life. Of course, his price for such gifts is enslavement in this world and eternal destruction with him in the lake of fire. This physical turmoil mirrors the turmoil of nations. Old political paradigms are crumbling. It's my opinion that we're seeing a shift in spiritual reality that is having physical and political consequences. The day of judgment is rushing upon us. I believe that the physical coming of the kingdom of God predicted in the book of Daniel is at hand. That kingdom will crush and destroy the kingdoms of this world. We see things that are happening and moving in strange directions. Each month our ultimate message is make straight the road of your life for the arrival of the King. Jesus, our Savior and Lord, is coming. And if He is not the Lord of your life, now would be a very good time to confess your sins and ask for His mercy. For those who believe in Jesus, the issue of our citizenship in this world is going to become more and more problematic. Now, the clash of the kingdom of heaven with the kingdoms of this world will increase. I love America and I pray for it. It is one of the great blessings of my life to have been born here. I have worn the uniform of the United States Army and fought in one of her wars. I believe in our Constitution and the government that it created. It is the best in the history of the world. All of that said, the tragic reality is that the moral and spiritual diseases of America that have been metastasizing for well over a hundred years are speeding us toward what we can only classify as national death. The outward signs of that coming are, are all around us. Broken families, the individual and collective loss of physical wealth, security and freedom, the dominating power of corrupt institutions, uh, both public and private, the rise of political and business leaders who of every stripe for whom greed and corruption are a way of life, the ever-growing violence in our communities and so much more. Now it's argued by some that what I've listed are just the endless complaints of antiquated moralists, uh, that we have faced these kind of societal crises in the past and that throughout history, this era is no different. We're just on that same kind of an up or down slope. But I contend for a number of reasons that we are con confronting something very, very new and very different. I, I want to go through a few of those differences because I believe there is a prophetic dimension to our crisis. More and more, where our treasure really lies is going to be tested. Also, as members of God's kingdom, these should be issues of prayer for national awakening and repentance. The first crisis that I believe we face is, the, is different from the past is the mainstreaming of pornography. A mighty river of violence is flowing through the homes of America, including many Christian homes. Never before in history has there been such immediate access to this addictive vileness. In ancient Rome, there was every form of prostitution, and the games were deeply violent and obscene in nature. But none of it was available in every home at the touch of a key. In all of our nation's history, this is new. Over and over now we are seeing, and I know you've seen them, national leaders fall to the most ignorant, self-destructive sexual activities. Why is this so? It is so because pornography makes you stupid. 
When you are under the ever-increasing domination of pornography, the vicious law of diminishing returns is a cancer in your life. Satanic spirits of ignorant lust take control. Slowly but surely, like an animal to slaughter, you are driven to experience ever deeper corruption in order to achieve an acceptable level of pleasure. This burning desire impels you to do increasingly stupid acts. Intellectually brilliant people become blind, arrogant jackasses, and we've seen it over and over. Pornography drives us to utter selfishness and stupidity in male-female relationships. And God help the children. This stupidity is not limited to the sexual arena. We are whole beings. The idea that we can compartmentalize our addicted stupidity into private boxes of sleaze may be Clinton-esque, but for a society, it is suicidal. Collectively, when pornography is in control of a whole culture, that culture becomes incapable of making rational political decisions because rational political decisions are based upon historic agreements about morality that have given us a civilized world. America has become a stupid nation, obsessed with its genitalia. Little else matters, and this is a deadly first in our history. Second, and this is a logical... Uh, result of a pornographic society, or are we facing an astounding disrespect for human life? The result of men who disrespect women and women who disrespect themselves is a collective disrespect for all of humanity, especially the weakest among us. In America, there is now far more collective outrage over the killing of puppies and kittens for the murder over the, compared to the murder of babies in the womb. Right now, through the murder of abortion, we more than equal the murders of Nazi Germany. This deathly devaluation of human life manifests itself throughout our culture. But nowhere is it more apparent and promoted than right here in Hollywood. As all of you know, I've been a member of this industry and been deeply involved in it. I love the people of Hollywood. I love the vast creative potential here. I have many friends who are in this industry. But I say this with all of that and with a broken heart. Hollywood is under a terrible judgment from God, and that judgment is coming. Third, this period of American history is different because of the amazing rise of greed on every level of society. In this Bible study, we've talked about consumerism and where it came from in the United States. The result is that as a nation, we have become cynical and glutted, willing to spend ourselves into bankruptcy, both individually and collectively, so that we can suck up products that we hope will give some meaning to our empty lives. We have tried to find our value as human beings in pleasure and possessions. Consequently, step by step, all of these are going to be taken away from us. I firmly believe that, and the process has already begun. The fourth difference from America of the past is the pervasive use of drugs. From the smallest towns to the highest levels of society, we are awash in chemical addiction. Horrifying as they are, the physical and psychological components of this addiction are not the most dangerous element. I know that sounds amazing. How can it be true? What could be worse? Throughout history, drugs have been the doorway to dark supernatural power and spiritual enslavement. And only in our stupid pseudo-scientific culture have we lost respect for what the most primitive cultures understood. Drugs are the door to demonic influence and possession. Now, many primitive cultures, and I've studied a number of them, have desired that influence and possession. But at least they went into it with a certain level of clarity and respect, not so the dilettante shamans of America. By their own admission, many, many of our national and state leaders have used drugs, some of them extensively. And as we all know, many leaders in Hollywood use them right now. Without the cleansing blood from sin through the blood of Jesus, dark spiritual powers will continue to influence a user's life, even after they have broken from the physical demands of addiction. What does this add up to? Based on the pervasive use of drugs, we have become a demon-influenced and possessed society. The idea that we are living in such a society explains a lot, doesn't it? Terrifying and confusing eruptions of violence and self-destruction were a demonic norm in the days of Jesus, and so they are becoming today in America, though we refuse to acknowledge it. But most dangerous of all are what Roman Catholic priest Malachi Martin called the perfectly possessed. Those who do not fight the dark powers, but welcome and co-labor with them, 
the destruction they wreak can be national and international in scope. Our national response to the spiritual crisis of pervasive drug use has been utterly blind and foolish. You do not massage away demonic influence and control through therapy. You do not overcome the dark lords of Satan by any police action called a war on drugs. Fifth, as a, as a culture, we have spread our spiritual cancer to the whole world. Last I read, our two largest and most profitable exports are entertainment and weapons systems, including aircraft for war. Jesus warned that sin must come into the world, but woe to the one who brings it. And collectively, it is logical to say, woe to the nation that brings it. God hates violence as we have spread violence around the globe. Is it surprising that violence now rages in our cities and towns? We are reaping what we have sown and much worse is to come. Sixth and last is to me the most awful difference of the past. It's awful because it is a condemnation of Christians in America. For several generations, the church that claims Jesus as Lord and God, the so-called evangelical church, has stopped carrying his message into our culture. Instead, we have become nothing more than a child of that culture, broken and emasculated by the darkest forces at work in this world. Church is supposed to be the representation of the kingdom of God on earth. That's what we Christians are supposed to be in Hollywood. But morally, ethically, creatively, we are a little different from the world around us. What has happened? Why are we in this ongoing state of disaster? I've puzzled about this for a long time. There are many reasons, but tonight I want to point on to one that, in my opinion, is the heart of it all. As Christians, we have walked away from our historic belief in the absolute authority of the Bible in our lives. That authority has been usurped and replaced by the words of false leaders, false teachers, and false shepherds who are destroying the church in America. Could that be true? Have we really walked away from the Bible? Well, we still claim that it's our authority, but the evidence proves the exact opposite. For a few minutes, I want to take you down a strange path. Please stick with me on this. The destruction of the authority of the Bible began its modern form of over 200 years ago in Germany and has now worked its way almost into every aspect of the church in this country. Um, how many of you heard the, have heard the word inerrancy in the past? Ever heard that word, inerrancy? It's a new word for many of you. It sounds like a boring term, doesn't it? It sounds like a technical term, but it's extremely important. Inerrancy is the doctrine that in the original documents, which we no longer possess, the Bible was without error. There were no mistakes in it at all because it was given by God. What do you think of that idea? Does it sound reasonable to you? I think for many Christians today, the answer to that would be, well, not really. Yes, it was inspired by God, but it's a human book. You know, and, and haven't people found all kinds of errors in it? Uh, so how could the original documents have been without error? God didn't write them himself on stone tablets like he did for Moses. Uh, so the idea of an error-free Bible just doesn't make a lot of sense. Is it really important anyway? Can't we love and respect the Bible without believing such an antiquated, superstitious idea? The doctrine of inerrancy depends on what is called the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. Now, that's really heavy duty. The weeds are getting higher, aren't they? Stick with me. Sounds like something for a seminary class, but it isn't. Don't be fooled. Those words deeply impact your life as a Christian. What does inspiration mean? I'm sure you've heard the word inspired. If you've been in church, pastor talk about the, the Bible. They call it the inspired word of God, don't they? It sounds nice and it sounds respectful. The word inspired literally means God breathed. But how did God breathe and inspire human authors? But he wanted, he wanted those authors to write the various books of the Bible. Now practically, and I'm a writer, so I think practically about these things, there's only one way he could have done it, due to the nature of human consciousness. He did it through giving those men both the words and the ideas that he wanted them to have as they wrote. Now that said, God didn't stand over them and dictate each book. The human writers of the Bible weren't just secretaries. Uh, he wanted their individual knowledge, their styles, their personalities to appear in what they wrote. He wanted to co-labor with them. 
So he gave them the ideas and thoughts that he wanted them to understand and communicate in their writing. I'm a writer. There's no way to have a thought or idea without words. You can have nonverbal feelings. You can have emotions, but not a thought. So the ideas and thoughts that came from God entered their minds through the medium of words. In a mysterious and wonderful way, God empowered these men through his Holy Spirit so that their minds engaged with his mind to perform an amazing creative act to bring his word into the world. So what do verbal and plenary mean? Verbal means that the very words of the Bible in their original languages as written in those first documents, are an exact record of the mind and will of God. Plenary means that the entire text from the Bible, from beginning to end, is equally from God, although some parts of it are more important than others. So inerrancy is the doctrine that what these men wrote on scrolls, or whatever the medium was, came directly from God and was without error because God does not make mistakes. Therefore, the Bible is our ultimate trustworthy authority, expressing what God wants us to know about himself and his will for both for us individually and collectively as a race. When he walked in this world, Jesus certainly believed in that kind of inerrancy as far as the Old Testament is concerned. Remember he wrote, he said this, do you remember what he said? It was Matthew 5, 18 and 19. He said these words, For assuredly I say to you, Till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. A jot and tittle are the smallest strokes in the Hebrew script. In Luke 24, 44, Jesus said, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. We don't have time tonight to talk about all the arguments in favor of an inerrant Bible in the original documents. Those arguments come from a very technical scholarly work called textual criticism. It's not destructive criticism. Uh, It is textual criticism or scholars concerned that the Bible we read be as close as possible to the original documents, and they have a number of ways of determining that. Where they find errors, they view them as errors in transmission since the books were copied by hand over centuries. The report of textual scholarship over centuries is very clear. The number of errors in the Bible is incredibly small, and there are answers for all of them. And none of those errors affect in any way any significant teaching in Scripture. We could spend a lot of time proving that statement in detail. We don't have time to do that tonight. So where does this leave us? What's the point I'm trying to make with this? within very many evangelical, charismatic, Pentecostal churches, the belief in inerrancy has been quietly discarded. This began generations ago in our seminaries. Today, many of our evangelical leaders, including many pastors, claim to believe in a vague kind of inspiration of Scripture, but not inerrancy. This has left us in the church with a terrible and rather cancerous question. If it is possible that there could be errors in the original documents, how are we to know what is from God and what is just a human concoction? If we ask that question, we get a very vague answer from those who believe in a vague inspiration. Something along the lines of, trust the Holy Spirit, He will guide us to all truth. The subtle influence of this loss of belief in inerrant Bibles, in in an inerrant Bible, has been devastating to the Western Christian Church. The absolute authority of Scripture is no longer taught on any meaningful level. So people are left to decide for themselves what they will accept from the Bible and what they won't. But we still tip our hats to the idea of biblical authority. We still read the Bible in our services. But rarely do we see what I grew up experiencing, powerful, what is known as expository preaching from God's Word, from pastors deeply immersed in the Scripture who had absolute faith in its authority. Instead, we are given an endless diet of topical homilies with the Bible as supporting material. From our churches, this low view of Scripture has invaded Christian homes. No longer is the Bible read every day, both individually and as families. No longer do we see a need for our children to attend Sunday school so they will know the Bible. So Sunday schools are passing away, along with the rest of what used to be called Christian education. Few who are not professional pastors and scholars struggle on their own to understand and communicate to others something from God's Word. 
At best, we are satisfied to watch a DVD created by some national expert or listen to a sermon by a star pastor. Now, there's nothing wrong with that unless it keeps us from experiencing the Bible on our own. And so often that is exactly what happens. It's the end result of this practical lack of belief in the authority and centrality of the Bible. Moral chaos in our congregations. This moral chaos infects everyone from pastors to the lowliest parishioners. In consequence, we Christians, we Christians here in Hollywood, have no collective moral authority to speak to the world. This disaster is at the highest levels of Christian leadership in America, where we are inundated with charming, skilled blatherers who claim to speak for God but who have no biblical authority to do so. There are many, many examples of this, but I will share one that Carol and I experienced on a personal level. In the late 90s, Carol and I were hired to write a script for a large-budget animated musical based on the life of Christ. Uh, The project was to be financed and produced by a wealthy national Christian leader who is known on television for speaking with authority on a wide array of, of subjects. Along with a small team of producers, we were flown to England to meet this person who was on vacation. We spent four days with him in a private rented villa in the town of Bath. In many ways, it was a shocking experience. Our purpose was to talk about the story for our script. And the story for the script, obviously, would be based on the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As our time with this national Christian leader progressed, we began to realize that he didn't really know the story of Jesus in the Gospels. His ignorance was both ridiculous and disturbing. Even worse, the man didn't care about the actual story of Jesus. Rather, to him, it seemed to be kind of an irritation when we brought up the New Testament. His own ideas were all that really mattered. He wanted us as writers to consider him the ultimate authority for our script. As you can imagine, our response to this was somewhat, how shall I say it, just to touch ever so slightly confrontational. (laughs) It was not a fun meeting for four days. By the time all was finished, no one would speak to him except my sweet wife, Carol, who was willing to speak to the greatest heretics in the world, I guess. Anyway, this is horrifying, but it's the truth. I'm telling you, this is personal experience. It was clear by many of his actions with our small group during those four days that in spite of all his high-sounding spirituality, in spite of his godlike fatherly television persona, This man takes a low view of the Bible. It's a thing to be used when it suits him. To achieve whatever end he has, he is far from alone among our leaders. I could tell you of another wealthy and famous Christian leader, a Bible teacher, an author, whom I have known personally, who has taken millions to bolster his political agenda from Sun Myung Moon. He teaches from the Bible, but does not live by it. My friends, we are in deep trouble. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, God tells us through St. Paul exactly what purposes he intends for the Bible. This is a passage that you ought to know. You ought to know it by heart. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. In this period of history, we have a desperate need to understand what those words mean and how to apply them. Let's look at the key words used here. All Scripture. Clearly, the writers of the New Testament believe the Old Testament was Scripture, and they also believe that they were writing Scripture. That's clear from a number of things that were said. All Scripture is good for something. What is it good for? First, it's good for doctrine. What is doctrine? That's another word that really doesn't sound very much fun, does it? That's sort of a constipated, legalistic-sounding word. Doctrine is a system of authoritative beliefs that guides our lives. A system. Do you have a system of authoritative beliefs based from the, from the Bible that guides your life? Or is your life guided by sort of a vague stew of spiritual impressions and feelings? If so, the Bible isn't guiding you very much at all. You're guiding yourself. 
The very word doctrine implies two other words. Mental discipline. I'm the son of a godly man. I was a professor of Bible, a true scholar and theologian. My father knew the Bible better than any person I've ever known in my life. In a unique way, I was blessed both because both he and my mother taught me the Bible through all my growing up years. As Carol remembers, and Carol and I started dating in high school, she would come over to our house, and very often Sunday dinners in our house after church, we, were, we spent discussing the great doctrines of the Bible. From my earliest years, this was given to me. Few of us grow up in that kind of home. Nevertheless, all of us have the responsibility to gain an authoritative system of beliefs from the Bible that will guide our lives. In large part, the teaching work of the church should be to give people that kind of system. Well, it isn't happening. So it's up to us. But are we willing to do it? Second, St. Paul says that Scripture is good for reproof. Oh, now here's where things get tough. The Greek word that's used here means to convict of sin, to punish and to refute error. That's pretty heavy duty. My translation says reproof. Yours may say rebuke. They both mean the same thing, to criticize and censure. Criticize? None of us like criticism. I mean, I'm a writer. I always people. I, love, I don't want you to love everything I do. I don't want to be criticized. I may ask someone, to, "Would you tell me what you really think?" I want you to say only one thing. I love it. It's perfect. <laughs> you know, that's the way writers think. We don't really want criticism. No criticism. None of us like it. And censure is even worse. What is censure? Censure means harsh rebuke and disapproval. St. Paul is saying that this is one of the most important ways God uses His Word in our lives to criticize and censure us when we need it. Why do we need it? Because we're doing things that are destructive to ourselves and others. We're doing things that separate us from God and His will. All of that the Bible calls sin. Some of it we may be aware of, but I'm afraid that a whole lot of it we're not aware of at all. Now, there's a whole system of cliché misunderstandings about rebuking, criticizing, and judging, etc. in the church. We're not talking about using the Bible to beat other people over the head. We're talking about God himself speaking directly to us through his word about things that are wrong in our lives. It is God in love saving us from our destructive patterns through criticism and censure administered by the Holy Spirit. Now certainly he can speak to us through effective preaching and teaching in the body of Christ, but when it is effective, always it will be from the Bible. Now that kind of criticism and censure from the Holy Spirit can create a terrible word, and that word is guilt. That's another terrible bad word. You know, I can have, you're just trying to guilt me, man. That's what we're trying. To, that's what Christians are always accused of doing, isn't it? Please understand something. There's godly guilt and there's false guilt. Satan never wants you to have godly guilt. When that starts to come, he will gloss it over and try to make you forget with everything in his power, a million different ways, he'll give you a million distractions. He doesn't want you to experience true godly guilt. Instead, what he wants you to do is to be enslaved by false guilt. Godly guilt can lead you to repentance and a changed life in Christ. False guilt will lead you to depression, rage, and self-pity. And there are an awful lot of Christians who are bound up right there. They're dealing with false guilt. I don't like to be told that I'm wrong, that I'm sinning, because then there's one thing that's a responsibility of mine. I have to repent. And repentance isn't fun. This process of reproof and rebuke is vital at every stage of our lives as disciples of Jesus. But especially if we are immature believers with little, with little grounding in the faith. Some of us don't, e <clears throat> don't even know we're immature believers. Are you willing to find out if you're an immature believer or not? You're willing for God to use His Word in your life in this way? If so, start seriously studying the Bible, praying that God will speak to you where you need it, and trust me, He will. If you don't want to do that, stop pretending that you're a follower of Jesus at all. Back to our passage, Scripture is good for another thing. It's good for correction. The Greek word here means to straighten something out that has become crooked. Correction is offering an improvement or replacing a mistake, setting things right. 
This has to do with the word righteousness that we discussed in a previous study. To be righteous means that your life is straightened out. It isn't crooked anymore. So in His Word, God does not simply criticize and censure us. If He left it there, that would be a devastating thing. But as we repent, He offers a different path to us. He shows us how to stop making the same mistakes over and over again. He shows us how to set things right in our relationships with Him and with others. He offers us the opportunity to obey for our own eternal good. And when I was growing up, I was a very disobedient kid. I hated correction. That led to be a, being a disobedient adult Christian. And after all the years of being taught the Bible as an adult, I had to learn how to hear and obey God's correction. And I'm still learning it, though I hope on a different level. Finally, Scripture is for instruction in righteousness. This goes hand in hand with correction, making a crooked life straight. The Greek word for instruction means disciplined training that we submit to voluntarily. Do you see the process here? We come to God's Word and it censures us by shining the light on all of our sin. And over time, this, this continues and God begins to clean us out. In each area, we are corrected. We're straightened out where we're bent and crooked. Then starts the discipline training to make us useful for the kingdom of heaven. In the past, I've talked about my experience in the army. As I have said, when I got to the army, I was in terrible physical condition. I hated gym class all the way through high school. I was never in sports. As you know, I've, I've said in the past, I got myself assigned to the handicapped gym class in high school. I had never run a mile in my life. Uh, I, I, worse than all of that, as bad as that is, I was, I was in terrible mental condition. I was just not willing to accept discipline. You know, I got to basic training. I was very physically miserable for quite a long time and emotionally miserable as well. Those people in basic training were hellishly committed to getting me into shape. And I couldn't run away to do something easier. I mean, as a Christian in the past, I could always sort of run to something else. When reality set in and God was requiring something of me, I could just, I could distract myself with something else. You know, I couldn't just flunk my way out the way I'd done through a lot of high school. That didn't really work either very well there in basic training. And my pride wouldn't just, I just couldn't allow myself to just walk away from it. I had to submit to it. It was all or nothing. And my gentle drill instructors dedicated themselves to reshaping both my mind and my body. Why did they do this? So that I could be trained as a soldier and ultimately as a leader. Where I was going a year later, my life and the lives of others would depend on my submission to their discipline and to their will. Only when I reached a certain level of mental and physical fitness could my real training begin. There's a direct analogy to be drawn here with the way God wants to shape and prepare us through His Word, the Bible. What does Paul say all this reproving and correcting and instructing are for? That we may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work useful for the work of God's kingdom in this world, prepared to do battle in the greatest war of all, the war for the souls of men and women. Why is the church so ineffective? Because we really don't believe in the Bible. No longer do we allow it to do its work in our pulpits, our homes, and our lives. So we're not equipped for God's work in this world. We're useless to the kingdom. Worse, we're dangerous. We're like untrained soldiers wandering around on a battlefield not knowing which end of a rifle to aim at the enemy, much less how to follow a command. How low or high is your view of the Bible? The proof is in your actions. Are you spending personal time in God's Word each day? Are you really listening for God to speak to you in any way He chooses? If you're married or have children, is there any kind of regular focus on Bible reading and prayer in your family? Do you do it with your husband and wife? I know it's hard, but we find time to do the things that matter, don't we? Friends, the kingdom of heaven is coming. This Bible is the guidebook for citizens of that kingdom. You cannot have a Christian life that means anything without it. Now, all that said, all that I've said to this point has been sort of the negative side. It's been a warning. But there's another side, and when you begin to experience it, it is absolutely wonderful and amazing. 
As we commit ourselves to reading and obeying God's Word, we are given the mind of Christ. Why did Jesus come into this world? He came to create and establish a new race of set-apart righteous humans to fit, to fit to rule with Him in the kingdom of heaven. Without crushing our personalities and our uniqueness, He wants His mind to fully engage with yours and mine so that we can co-labor with Him. Does that sound weird and kind of strange that the, the mind of Christ wants to engage with yours? Could it be biblical? So look at a scripture. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 13 says this, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the spiritual things of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now the word spiritual is thrown around everywhere these days, isn't it? You've heard it many times. I'm sure even in the past week you've heard people say it on TV. According to the Bible, to be spiritual means nothing less than to have the mind of Christ fully engaged with yours. What did Paul mean by the mind of Christ? What is the mind of Christ? You know, the Greek word that's translated mind is the word nous. It means intellect as expressed in thought, feeling, and will. Therefore, to have the mind of Christ means to have a Christ-transformed and empowered human consciousness. It means that on an ever-increasing level, he will share his thoughts and feelings and will with you. Then you will show the world through your loving decisions, actions, and mature spiritual knowledge what the love of Jesus really looks like. His living presence will shine through our personalities and our deeds. Do you think that's possible? Maybe it's impossible. Maybe you should mention to Jesus that it's really impossible for him to do that in your life. Tell him he just can't handle that kind of task in you. Uh, he can and will do that work, you know, but it doesn't happen overnight. That's where a lot of us get discouraged because there are many Christians who have a completely screwed up attitude about how that his work in our lives, giving us his mind, really happens. There are rafts of slug, lazy Christians today who believe that righteousness, a transformed life, having the mind of Christ, is something that God just blasts into our brains. Many have a false, unbiblical theology of the Holy Spirit. I think their idea is once you get baptized in the Spirit, it's all done. You just dance along and let God do whatever He's going to do and everything's wonderful. You just kind of drown in spiritual maturity. And you pray and God gives you whatever you want. That's the attitude, I think, of a lot of Christians. What satanically inspired foolishness. Here's the truth. If you want the mind of Christ alive in your mind, empowering your life, 2 Corinthians 10.2 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now those are warrior words. These are words of godly discipline. Or do we get these joyful, powerful, spiritual weapons at the point where we are willing to fight the most awful spiritual battles of all inside ourselves? Where are the strongholds? Where are the nasty arguments? Where are the high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God? I'll tell you where they are. They're inside me, first of all. I am given these weapons as I bring every thought in captivity to the obedience of Christ. That, my friends, is brutal work. It's the discipline, the spiritual discipline of a lifetime. And God doesn't do it for you. He gives us the power to do it, but we have to exert the will, the concentration. We have to spend the time. This is what it means to co-labor with God in the spiritual transformation of your life. This is what Paul means in Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, 
but now much more in my absence, absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. In fear and trembling at our weakness, we work to show the meaning of God's salvation in our lives as we do our little work. He works much more, straightening, fulfilling, completing his good pleasure. One work will not happen without the other, and neither will happen without the empowering word of God that we call the Bible deeply in our lives. Now, most of us here tonight probably consider ourselves creative people, artists. Being a creative person myself, I know a lot about us. The first thing I know is that we are slavishly, often maniacally disciplined about our particular craft or art. We are dedicated to it, aren't we? We pursue it. We don't want to present anything to the world that isn't our best. But in so many other areas of life, we tend to be lazy, undisciplined slugs. Uh, am I right about that? You know, okay, except the musicians. I have noticed that musicians are obviously maniacal and obsessive about almost everything. I'm going to say things. I want to say some things right now that are very tough on us as creative people. But I can't tell you how important I think they are for each one of you. Of all people, as creative, artistic Christians, we desperately need the knowledge and discipline of the Bible and the co-laboring with the Holy Spirit of God to bring us into spiritual maturity, especially as far as our creative gifts are concerned, because he wants to use those gifts to speak to the church and to the world. It's my belief, after decades of knowing artistic Christians, that most of us never reach our full potential. Uh, we never find the fullness of God's purposes for us as citizens of his kingdom in this world. Why? For no other reason than we are lazy, narcissistic, and self-centered. We refuse the discipline that will lead us to growing up in the Lord. Yes, I said growing up in the Lord. We refuse God's healing because it will take effort and honesty and pain on our part to participate in that healing. We refuse to change in vital areas because to do so, we will have to listen to things about ourselves that we don't want to hear. We will have to take seriously God's censure and obey his correction. Instead, we crawl back into our little creative holes. We live in those cocoons because there we think we're in control. The very gifts that God has given to us for his glory and our joy, we use to run from him. Creatively, what's the result of this? I'll tell you what the result is for you if you work in the kingdom of Hollywood. If that's the way your life is being lived, Fear and insecurity are going to be the controlling factors in your life because you're trying to empower the gifts that God has given to you with your own energy. And the great beast loves for that to happen. The awful tragedy is that in refusing the effort and pain that comes with God's discipline, we never receive the deeper joy of co-laboring with him in wonderful, heavenly, violent acts of setting prisoners free. The amazing thing is that God's reproof, correction, and discipline are given through the Bible. They're given through his self-sacrificing love. As most of you know, I was involved as a writer and producer in the old TV series, The Equalizer. For four years, what a challenge, what an amazing and wonderful battle it was to bring the echo of God's love into that show. You take risks to say things in story. But at the end of it all, when you close the whole thing down, when they wrap, and it's all finished, you know, I couldn't help but feel like, what did we really do here? What was accomplished? Did it mean anything? Did it mean anything at all? Several weeks ago, you know how long the equalizer was on? That's the late 1980s. Several weeks ago, I received an email, and I'd like to share it with you. It's very short. It came from a woman named Dina. She wrote this to me. I stumbled across the mentioning of the Equalizer today and wanted to send you a note. When this show came on the air, I was in elementary school. My father had just died, and I found myself in an abusive home life. Your show gave me hope that there was someone who cared. It was just a television show, but at the time it was all I had. I haven't really thought about it in years, but I wanted you to know. Thanks. 
I can tell you with absolute certainty what the world expected. What the kingdom of Hollywood expected of the equalizer was violence and vigilantism. And that is what Satan and his dark lords had planned and what they tried to produce. But God had something else in mind. He wanted to plant some seeds, even through Hollywood. As a Hollywood storyteller, I can't tell you how important the knowledge of the Bible has been to me. And as God used it in my life for reproof, for correction, for discipline, I can't tell you how my stories have been transformed. I have experienced the amazing joy of co-laboring with Him. I want that for every one of you. See, it all comes in a package, though. Increasing knowledge of His Word, the transforming power of His Word, the knowledge of Jesus through His Holy Spirit, and on and on it goes. This never ends. We're living in dark days. Many kingdoms are going to crumble, but Jesus' kingdom will last forever. And it's built on the Bible. In the days that are to come, you will want and desperately need the power of the Bible in your life. If it isn't really there, now's the time to start. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the fact that you loved us enough to give us your word. You gave us the living word who is Jesus himself, and then you gave us the word of Scripture where we meet Jesus and more than simply meet him as an historic personality, we meet him in power. We meet him in your love. Thank you for that. Thank you for this word that is so alive. We pray that you would give us the strength through your Holy Spirit to apply it in our lives. Guide us as we read it. Help us to be disciplined in this, Lord. Thank you for all you've done in giving us this amazing book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. History is moving fast, and it's going to move much faster. Do you know Jesus the King? Have you asked him to forgive your sins? Have you given your life to him? Are you studying his word, the Bible? You're going to need it in the dark days ahead. There's no better time to start learning than now. If we can help you, please write to us, thorncrownstudios at gmail.com. History had a beginning and it will have an end. I hope you're ready.